Church, I invite you to turn with me this morning in God's Word to the book of Joshua, Joshua chapter 5. As we continue through the book of Joshua, we're going to come to a passage that will require our careful attention because it is going to allude to many other passages in Scripture and require us to really connect the Bible from beginning to end. The the significance of Joshua 5 would be easy to miss if you were just reading through the book quickly. And so part of why we want to study through books of the Bible and, and why I preach through books of the Bible is because Joshua 5 is incredible and you could miss it if you did not read it carefully. I've entitled the sermon this morning, God Renewing His Covenant with Us. God Renewing His Covenant with Us. That is what happens here in the chapter. God renews His covenant promises to His people. And brothers and sisters, we need today for God to continually renew in our hearts His covenant with us. We need to draw near to our God, remember His promises, keep His covenants as He keeps them faithfully toward us. We are going to see that the promises that God made centuries before to His people, He has not forgotten, and He always keeps His Word. Now, the people have crossed the Jordan River in chapters 3 and 4. They have stepped foot into Canaan, into the promised land, and in Joshua 5 verse 1, we continue to see how God is on the move as His people obey Him and go into the land that He has promised. Joshua 5 verse 1, we read, and as soon as all the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to the west, and all the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea, heard that the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan for the people of Israel until they had crossed over, their hearts melted. And there was no longer any spirit in them because of the people of Israel. I love this. We we saw it in chapter 2 where Rahab told the spies, They've heard about what God has done for you. And the hearts of the people of Jericho have melted within them because they've heard of what your God can do. And once again here in chapter 5, when, when, when God stops the Jordan River from flowing supernaturally so that the people could cross, and they come across to the other side, and obviously there had been Canaanites who was, were watching what was happening and they saw the miracle and they go back and they report it to their kings. It says that all the people and all the kings of the Canaanites, powerful men with armies, when they heard about what God had done for His people, their hearts melted within them. Brothers and sisters, do you know that we serve a God who can melt hearts? We serve a God who is sovereign over the heavens and the earth and especially over people. This is why we do not need to be afraid of people because God can melt hearts. He can change hearts. He can save souls. He can can move the mountains. He can stop the waters. Our God is in the heavens. He does whatever He pleases. Psalm 115 verse 3. And so as we look at Joshua chapter 5 verse 1, we see that the kings of the Canaanite people saw and heard what God had done and they were terrified. Not so much of the people of Israel, but of Israel's God. Verse 2 We continue, it says, Now at that time, the Lord said to Joshua, Make 
flint knives and circumcise the sons of Israel a second time. Now stop right there. Okay, don't let your eyes gloss over. Pay attention. Okay, I, I know you read this and you go, what? what? They're going to do, huh? Well, that's not exciting. This sounds kind of boring. What does that even mean? And I'm not going to explain it in detail, but I, I am going to say this. He's alluding to Genesis chapter 17. And if you didn't pick up on that, this is important. You need to read your Bible systematically from beginning to end. When it says in verse 2 that God commanded Joshua to make flint knives and circumcise the sons of Israel a second time, that should make you realize that something big is happening here. God made a covenant with Abraham. And God's covenant with Abraham had a sign, circumcision, that every male child would be circumcised on the eighth day after his birth. Just as under the new covenant, we have signs. Do you know what the signs of the new covenant are? They are baptism and the Lord's Supper. And we celebrate baptism when someone comes to faith in Christ. And we celebrate the Lord's Supper together as a way of remembering the covenant that God has made with us through His Son, Jesus Christ. Well, God made a covenant with Abraham in Genesis chapter 17. And in that covenant that God made with Abraham, He said that the circumcision of every Male child on the eighth day after birth would be a sign and a testimony and a reminder that God is going to keep His promises to His people. And here's what's so important. While God has kept His promises, the people of Israel have not kept theirs. Oh, they said they would be faithful to the Lord and follow Him and trust Him and serve Him and do whatever He commanded, but remember... In Numbers 13, you remember that from several weeks ago? When, when, when the spies went into the land, only two believed that God would give them the land. And at Kadesh Barnea, the spies gave their report to the people and the people said, we're not going in. We're not going in the land of Canaan. These people are too great for us. And they failed to trust their God. God kept His covenant promises But the people did not. Now God is telling Joshua that he is going to renew the covenant with his people. That God has not given up on us. Praise the Lord, he doesn't give up on us. Praise the Lord that he offers forgiveness if anyone would repent of his or her sins and come to him by grace through faith. And so God says, Joshua, you're going to circumcise the people for a second time. Verse 3, so Joshua made flint knives and he circumcised the sons of Israel at Gibeath har Aloth. And this is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. Don't miss this. Here's why. All the males of the people who came out of Egypt, all the men of war had died in the wilderness on the way after they had come out of Egypt. And though all the people who had come out had been circumcised, they bore the sign of the covenant that God made with Abraham. Yet, all the people who were born on the way in the wilderness when they were disobeying the Lord and not following the Lord, all the people who were born in the way in the wilderness after they had come out of Egypt had not been circumcised. Why had they not been circumcised? Because they had gotten away from the Lord. They had stopped following the Lord. They had stopped obeying His Word. Their hearts had been far from God and they did not keep His covenant. Verse 6, For the people of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness until all the nation, the men of war who came out of Egypt, perished. Because they did not obey the voice of the Lord. The Lord swore to them that He would not let them see the land that the Lord had sworn to their fathers to give to us. A land flowing with milk and honey. Verse 7. So it was their children whom He raised up in their place 
that Joshua was circumcised, for they were uncircumcised because they had not been circumcised on the way. Their parents' generation had gotten away from the Lord. And God said, with this new generation, I'm going to renew my covenant, and I'm going to give your children the land that I swore to you. A few things here. Number one, we once again see in the book of Joshua God's purpose and plan for our children and the next generation. Have you noticed this coming up again and again in the book of Joshua? Amen. Have you noticed this? That God put, puts an emphasis upon the importance of us teaching our children the truths of God's Word. Because one day you and I will be gone and our children will be left. And we must teach them to carry forth the Word of God and His truth. And when the parents fail, God says, I'll raise up their children after them and renew my covenant with them and fulfill my promises. Verse 8. And when the circumcising of the whole nation was finished, they remained in their places in the camp until they were healed. And the Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you, so that the name of the place is called Gilgal to this day. Gilgal comes from the Hebrew word to roll. And God rolled away the reproach of Egypt. Egypt representing unbelief in God. The pagan peoples of Egypt. And God says, I have rolled that away from you. Now I want to take a moment and read from Genesis 17 so that you will see the covenant that God had originally made with Abraham about 400 years before this that God is now renewing with Joshua and his generation. In Genesis 17 verse 1, we read of the covenant that God made with, at that time, Abram, later to be called Abraham. Genesis 17 verse 1 says, When Abram was 99 years old, by the way, God wasn't done with him yet, okay? So if you ain't 99 years old, God ain't done with you yet. And if you are, he's still not done with you, all right? When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty, walk before me and be blameless that I may make my covenant between me and you and may multiply you greatly. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but you shall be called Abraham. No longer just father, but the father of a multitude, the father of many. For I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. And I will make you into nations and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you. Notice God always has a plan for the next generation, for our children. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant. This is a covenant that has no end. It continues into eternity. What is his promise? To be God to you and to your offspring after you. And I will give to you and to your offspring after you the land of your sojournings, all the land of Canaan for an everlasting possession, and I will be, with, I will be their God. And God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. And this is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. 
You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. So now going back to Joshua 5, we see how important the covenant was in Genesis 17. So if you're just reading through Joshua 5 and you don't realize that he's referencing the covenant that God made with Abraham back in Genesis 17, you've missed the point. Brothers and sisters, when we read the Bible, we need to read it from beginning to end. The Bible is not a book of quotes that we, that we pluck out one at a time and just, you know, throw it up there on the wall and read that verse in isolation. No. The Bible is a collection of 66 books which the Holy Spirit of God inspired the prophets and the apostles to write and they all fit together beautifully. And you must read your Bible from Genesis through Revelation and every book in between if you're going to really understand what it's saying. Now, we're not done. God renews the covenant with His people through the sign of circumcision as He commands Joshua to circumcise the children whom their fathers had failed to circumcise for 40 years in the wilderness. And now... In Joshua 5 verse 10, God continues to renew His covenant through another sign, the Passover. Look at Joshua 5 verse 10. And while the people of Israel were encamped at Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month, in the evening on the plains of Jericho. It's important that they're right outside the city of Jericho, the city that they are about to go in and take. There is a battle ahead of them for Jericho. But before they go in, they need to get their hearts right with God, and God has to renew His covenant promises to them and renew their hearts through it. And so there they are encamped on the plains of Jericho, and they eat the Passover meal. Verse 11. And the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. And the manna ceased the day after they ate the produce of the land. God had been providing them manna from heaven to eat. But now get this, the land of Canaan itself, a land that flows with milk and honey, the land that God has given them is enough to sustain them. God always provides exactly what we need when we need it. Amen? And usually not a moment sooner. If you can't say amen, you better say ouch, right? That's what Bodie Bauckham says, one of my favorite preachers. Isn't that true? God provides us just what we need at the very moment that we need Him in order to make us less dependent on ourselves and more dependent upon Him. And so the manna ceased. There was no longer manna for the people of Israel, but they ate the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Now clearly, in the Passover, we are referencing a previous passage of Scripture. And as you read this, you ought to know that Joshua is referencing Exodus chapter 12. Just as when circumcision is mentioned, you know it's Genesis 17. When the Passover meal is mentioned, he's pulling up Exodus 12. So I want to read a bit for you from Exodus 12 so that you will understand the importance of that reference. Exodus 12, verse 21. This is before the people were to leave Egypt after the 10th plague, the plague of the firstborn son, which happened that night. So back in Exodus 12, it says in verse 21, Then Moses called all the elders of Israel, and he said to them, Go and select lambs for yourselves according to your clans, and kill the Passover lamb. Take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, and touch the lintel and the two doorposts with the blood that is in the basin. None of you shall go out of the door of his house until the morning. So, you're going you're gonna to kill a lamb. You're going to eat the lamb, but the blood, after you slaughter the lamb, is to be put into a bowl, and then you are to take hyssop, 
And you are to take the leaves of the hyssop and you are to to dip the branch with the leaves in the blood to to act as a sort of paintbrush. And then you are to take the blood and you are to put it over the doorpost and the lintel. And as you put it there over the doorpost and the doorframe, over the entrance to your home, it will be a sign. Verse 23, for the Lord will pass through to strike the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood on the lintel and the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to enter your houses to strike you. The blood of the lamb over your doorpost and the doorframe is a sign that God will not destroy your family. Because you're covered by the blood of the Lamb. Clearly, in the New Testament, the New Testament authors pick up on this as a reference to the blood of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, who was slain before the foundation of the world according to the eternal plan of God to pay for our sins. And if you're covered by the blood of the Lamb then the judgment for sin will not fall upon you because the Lamb's blood has already been spilt. So the Lord will pass over and He will not allow the destroyer to strike you or to enter your house. Continuing in Exodus 12, 24. Listen when God told Moses in his generation, you shall observe this right as a statute for you and your sons forever. Just like the covenant that God made with Abraham. It's a covenant that is everlasting. It's forever. It's eternal. And what had the people of Israel done for 40 years in the wilderness? They did not observe the covenant that God made with Abraham or the covenant that God made with Moses. God has made covenant promises, and for a generation, His people have been ignoring those promises when God originally commanded them to observe this as a statute for you and your sons forever. Teach this to your children. They need to know it. And when you come into the land that the Lord your God will give you, remember they didn't believe God. They said, oh, we can't take the land. Look how great these people are. But what had God said hundreds of years before? It is the land that the Lord your God will give you as He has promised. And you shall keep this servant service. And when your children say to you, Mom, Dad, what do you mean by this service? What, What is this Passover lamb and the blood over the doorpost? What does it mean? When your children ask you, what does it mean? You shall say to them, It is the sacrifice of the Lord's Passover. For He passed over the houses of the people of Israel in Egypt when He struck the Egyptians, but He spared our houses. And the people bowed their heads and they worshipped. And for 40 years, the people had not been keeping these covenants. And so now as God prepares Joshua and his generation after crossing the Jordan to go in and fight and to take Jericho and the rest of the land of Canaan which God promised to give them. God says, we need to get our hearts right. You you Israelites, you need to stop. Before you go to war, you need to get your heart right with God. God says, I'm going to renew my covenant with you. Because for four decades, you have forgotten about me and failed to trust me. Have any of you ever had a time in your life where you were wandering in the wilderness like the Israelites? Where you'd forgotten about the Lord? When you'd failed to remember His covenant promises to you? When you'd gone your own way rather than His way? I'm here to tell you today that God offers to renew His covenant promises with you. Now, I'm not saying that you lose your salvation and get it back. No, when you are saved truly and completely, God holds you and keeps you in the palm of His hand. But I want to say to you also, it's not a strange thing that we go through times in our lives where we, where we forget the covenant promises of God. Where our hearts are 
prone to wander. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love, as the hymn says. Right? And so God says, I'm going to renew my covenant through the signs of circumcision and the Passover feast and remind you of what I promised to do. And then God says, I'm going to do it. Now, there's a strange section of verses here at the end of chapter 5. And it's the best part. And you might read this and say, what in the world is going on here? But I don't want you to miss it. These are truly some of my favorite verses in the book of Joshua. It's, it's the part of the book that I've looked forward to preaching really more than any other part. So I want you to look carefully. After God renews his covenant promises... Look at what happens in Joshua 5, verses 13 through 15. Look carefully. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes and he looked. And behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? There's this man standing in front of Joshua with a sword drawn, ready for battle. And Joshua says to the man, Are you on our side or their side? Obviously, Joshua's thinking, I hope you're on our side because I'm I'm terrified of you. (laughs) Are you for us or our adversaries? Whose side are you on? And the man speaks in verse 14. And he said, No. But I am the commander of the army of the Lord, for now I have come. Whomever this man is, he says, I'm not here to join your army today, Joshua. I am the commander of the army of Yahweh, of the Lord. Who is that? Well, Joshua understands. Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals. Take off your sandals from your feet. For the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. Now, brothers and sisters, there is no doubt about who this person is. Not in my mind. Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped. Now, any time in the Bible where you have someone fall down in front of an angel to worship an angel, the angel always says, whoa, whoa, don't worship me. Worship God alone. In the book of Revelation, John made that mistake and the angel said, "Uh -uh, uh-uh, uh-uh, don't worship me. Worship God alone. Happened to Daniel too. Daniel bowed down to the angel and he said, Whoa, no, don't worship me. You only worship God. But Joshua falls down with his face to the earth and he worshiped this man, the commander of the Lord's army, and this man receives his worship. There is only one that this commander of the Lord's army can be. He must be the Lord himself. He must be God. And yet, he seems to also be distinct from the Lord because he says, I'm the commander of the Lord's army. So in one sense, he's worshipped as God. 
But there does seem to be a distinction between the persons of the Lord and the commander of the Lord's army. Almost as if, well, as if he's God, but there's a distinction between him and the person of the Lord and the one who is the commander of the Lord's army. He is the Lord, and yet he commands the Lord's army on the Lord's behalf. He is the one and true and living God, And yet there's a distinction between the persons of the Lord, God the Father, and the commander of the Lord's army, who I maintain is God the Son. I believe the commander of the Lord's army here in Joshua chapter 5 is the eternal Son of God, the Lord Jesus before His incarnation. I believe this is the same one who wrestled with Jacob. I believe this is the same one who later would appear to Gideon. I believe that this is the same one whom Isaiah saw in Isaiah 6 high and lifted up on the throne. And it says in John chapter 12 that when Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up on his throne, John tells us in his gospel in chapter 12 that Isaiah saw the glory of Jesus in that vision. Joshua falls down and he worships the commander of the Lord's army. And then notice what the commander of the Lord's army says. He says to Joshua, take off your sandals from your feet For the place where you are standing is holy ground. What does that remind you of? Exodus chapter 3. Now it's interesting in Exodus chapter 3, if you go and look at it, it says that the angel of the Lord spoke to Moses from the burning bush. And yet when the angel of the Lord begins to speak, he is Yahweh himself. He is the Lord God. I also believe that the angel of the Lord, not an angel, but the angel of the Lord, who appears in a number of places throughout the Old Testament, starting in in Exodus chapter 3, I believe that the angel of the Lord is... The Lord Jesus Christ before His incarnation. And the same one who spoke to Moses in the burning bush and said, take off your sandals from your feet because you're standing on holy ground because God Himself is present before you. He's the same one who says to Joshua here, take your sandals off your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And in case you think I'm making all this up, I believe this is exactly how the New Testament authors understood these theophanies in the Old Testament. What is a theophany? Well, it's just a fancy word that means an appearance of God. When someone sees God, literally sees God, right? Standing before them. And I believe that the New Testament tells us that these theophanies are not God the Father, they're not God the Spirit, but they are God the Son, And I believe John tells us that in his gospel in chapter 1. So turn there with me this morning. John chapter 1. I want to look at verses 17 and 18. I want you to see how the gospel writer John interprets these theophanies, these appearances of God in the Old Testament. John 1 verse 17. For the law was given through Moses... But grace and truth came through Jesus the Christ. And then after mentioning Jesus, he says in John 1.18, No one has ever seen God. And you might stop there for a moment and say, Well, wait a minute, I thought Jacob saw God and wrestled with him. I thought Moses saw God in the burning bush. And I thought that, well, I mean, it says Joshua worshipped somebody that he saw and Gideon and Isaiah saw God in chapter 6 and Ezekiel saw God in chapter 1 and who Daniel saw God in chapter 7 verse 13 uh, who were these men seeing throughout the Old Testament 
If they weren't seeing God, who are they seeing? Well, he's not done yet. Look at verse 18. No one has ever seen God. The only God who is at the Father's side, he has made him known. Now, if you're confused, let me explain. Go back to John 1 verse 1. It says in John 1 verse 1, In the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Now, at the very foundation of the world, the Word, the logos in Greek, the Word was there. But he was also with God and was God. Now, how can you be with God and be God at the same time? Well, they are one in being. They are the one true and living God, but they are, they are distinct in person, the Father and the Son. The Word, who later identified, is identified in verse 17 as Jesus, the Word is with God the Father, and He is God, right? This is the doctrine of the Trinity. He was in the beginning with God. So now when we get down to verse 18, we are told no one has ever seen God. What does he mean by no one has ever seen God? Well, he means God in the way he meant God in chapter 1, verse 1. The Word was with God. He's talking about the Father. Here's what he's saying in, in John 1 verse 18. No one has ever seen God the Father. God the Father has never been manifested or He's never shown Himself in some visible way. But the one and only God, the monogonese theos in Greek, the one and only God, there's only one God, and that one and only God who was at the Father's side at creation. He, Jesus, has made Him the Father known. In other words, John is saying in John 1 verse 18, you know all those people in the Old Testament who saw God? They were seeing Jesus before His incarnation. That's why when we get to John 12... John quotes the vision from Isaiah 6. And then in John 12, verse 41, John explains what it was that Isaiah saw in chapter 6. John 12, verse 41, Isaiah said these things because he saw Jesus' glory and he spoke of Him. That's who Isaiah was looking at when he saw the Lord high and lifted up on His throne. He saw Jesus. And so did Joshua. And so did Moses. And so did Gideon. And so did Ezekiel. And so did Daniel. Jesus is the eternal Son of God. He is the Creator of all things. He was there in the beginning with God the Father and God the Holy Spirit. And after God renews the covenant with His people, before they go into Jericho, the eternal Son of God, Jesus, before His incarnation, which would come 1,400 years later, Jesus shows up, stands before Joshua as a man with a sword drawn. By the way, read the description of Jesus in Revelation chapter 1. He's standing there as a warrior with a sword coming out of His mouth. I'm telling you, this is, this is tying together the Bible from Genesis to Revelation and every book in between. And Jesus comes before Joshua, and Joshua says, well, are you on my side or their side? And he said, look, this battle's mine. I'm not coming to join your army, I'm coming you to... I'm coming to tell you, I've already given you the victory. Joshua, I am the one who made these covenants with you. Joshua, I'm here. What does the commander of the Lord's army tell Joshua? He says, I have now come. I'm here. Brothers and sisters, 
He's here. He's with us. What did Jesus say before he ascended into heaven? He said, I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. He's here. He's with us. And if the Lord Jesus is with us, we don't need to be afraid. He showed up for Joshua and He shows up for us today. All we need to do is keep His covenant and be faithful to Him and He will take care of the rest. God wants to renew His covenant with you in your heart today. Jesus stands here today. And He says, I'm here. I've come. Will you trust me? And my question to you today is, will you trust him? The way that Joshua trusted him. The way that Isaiah trusted him. The way that Abraham trusted him. He offers you today the blessings of his covenant. He has come. Will you receive his covenant blessings by placing your faith in him? Let's pray. Father, we come this morning in the name of your Son, Jesus, and we are so thankful that the Lord Jesus shows up across the pages of Scripture inviting us to come to Him. And God, I pray that we would each examine our own hearts this morning and ask, am I really trusting in Christ? He's here. He's come. He's with us. Lord, help us to trust Him and obey Him. God, renew Your covenant even in each of our hearts this morning. Draw us near to You, Lord. Remind us of Your goodness and Your glory and Your splendor and Your power and Your majesty and Your faithfulness and Your mercy and Your love for each one of us. God, in this time, I pray that each one of us in our hearts would receive the renewal of your eternal covenant with us. And that if there's one here today who has not bowed the knee and placed his or her faith in Christ for salvation, I pray that now you would open their eyes, grant them the gift of faith, that they would come and make it known before this church that I am ready to follow Jesus. We ask these things in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen.